you it's time for the luke live lounge and i'm delighted to say that dolan and myself are joined this week by former villa captain it's tommy elphick tommy thanks ever so much for giving up your time and coming on to talk to us tonight first off how are you how are things at huddersfield yeah good um a lot of change in the summer uh unfortunately still struggling well actually turned a bit of a corner last few weeks with, with the injury but still not back from quite a serious injury so uh, I'm actually a year into it. It was a year last week, so it's uh, it's been painful. It's been like pulling teeth, to be honest. But um, especially the way it happened, like was was quite disappointing for a stupid tackle. Um, yeah. But it is what it is. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last year. Um, so hopefully, yeah, as I say, turning the corner now and 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 going to be not far off the new year. Hopefully. Because over the last few years, you've had some some rotten luck. I mean, we'll come on to it, but your, your time at Villa, you're probably one of the most unluckiest footballers I think mm-hmm. I've, I've ever come across. It's just how hard is it to just keep battling back from these big injuries? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a really serious injury when I was about 23, 24, um, sorry, 22, 23, just sort of coming on the scene at Brighton. Um, I was out for about, um, I think it was 14 months game to game. Um so I think that stood me in good stead for these injuries. Uh, I have been a little bit unlucky, as you say, but I, I try to learn every time I've had these injuries. They've always led to something for me. Um, there's, there's plenty of people that get the sort of injury I've got at the moment at a very young age, so I'd rather be getting it at 33 than 23. Yeah, sure. um, and as I say, it's just, just, just a learning curve, really, and, and try and use it as much as possible. Yeah, and Dolan, how, how are you, mate? Good. So I've gone early with the Christmas decorations, as you can see. So uh, nice and festive in this house. I watched uh, Home Alone as well on, on Tuesday night. So, yeah, I'm all good, mate. Yeah, can't complain. Just uh, cracking on. And uh, look, I'm actually looking forward to Saturday. For once, I've got strangely op- optimistic. Um, it always concerns me when you're optimistic, to be honest, because usually you're miserable and we've been doing all right when you're miserable. But if you're optimistic, there's probably problems ahead on Saturday. Exactly, exactly. No, it's all good, mate. Good, good. Tommy, your your Christmas tree up yet? While we're talking about Christmas trees and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, yeah. Probably why I'm getting all this bad luck. Mrs. keeps putting them up too early, but um, yes. Yeah. I'm like these weird times, so yeah, I'm all for it this year. Yeah, I've, I've got to admit, mine's up as well. Unfortunately, nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. Not my decision at all. But just talking about the weird times. What, what's it like being a footballer in these times? Because I guess you're still getting to go into work every day, which in, in some ways is a good yeah. thing. But I think people often don't think about the dangerous side of it. Like you obviously don't want to bring COVID back to your family and whatnot. Yeah. Just what's it been like? Yeah, I mean, f- like for the for for most footballers, we're all well. We are all pretty fit and and no underlying health issues, so we are at minimal risk. Um, but as you say, uh, very very lucky to be going in and, and staying active and got a lot of focus you know there's a lot of people out there losing jobs and unsure about the future so we're very very lucky I was one that was massive for, for getting back last year when all the talks were happening I was quite involved with the PFA and yeah. um, sat in on, on, on quite a few discussions with them about how we're going to do it and how, the, the time frame so I, I was I was one for getting it back I think mean, sport in general at the moment whatever sport it is that people are interested in sort of focus and and getting us back to some sort of normality. I haven't actually played with no fans. Um, they're the ones you, you feel for, really, especially with a club like Villa at the moment going so well. And, yeah. Um, you, can, you can park with a bin like this season, but hopefully not too far away now. Yeah, it's been a bit weird, this lockdown, because last lockdown you had the weather, but no football, and, and this lockdown... The weather's crap, but at least the football's back. So it's, it is a weird one, one for the for, for, for the yeah. fans and, and everyone involved at the, at the moment. Let's let's talk about Villa. I mean, I can't remember the last time I did a show without starting talking about Jack Grealish. Tommy, you'll you'll know him very well. I don't know how much of the England games you saw, but for him to get three starts, it really feels like now he's a massive part of Southgate and England's plans. Yeah, I think he's almost taken it out of Southgate's hands, isn't he? He's been that good yeah. and that impressive. Um, and you're talking about playing against Belgium, number one ranked team in the world, and players like Kevin De Bruyne on the pitch, and, and he's the man everyone's talking about. You know, it's, it's absolute huge credit to, to Jack because he has fought the issue. Um, I think he, 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 Gareth was almost coming under so much scrutiny and, and so much pressure to play, and he almost forced him to to do, to do that and put him in that situation. So 
huge credit to, to Jack and, and, and obviously for, for, for the staff at, at Aston Villa for getting him in that form as well. Yeah, and Dolan, I mean, we've seen him start in friendlies. It was thinking he wasn't going to get that start in a competitive game and that was what all the Villa fans wanted to see. And all, to be fair, a lot of Premier League fans and football fans in general wanted to see it as well. Just how good was it to see him running the show against the world number one ranked side? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm, I haven't got a massive sort of love for international football, and, and obviously, I'm not English, as you can tell. But I, I was, I was watching those English games um, during the week, just, just, just for Jack, really, because you sort of feel, um, you feel like he's part of the family, you know, because obviously, he's, called, he's come through, through the ranks, and, and we've, we've known about this talent for, for such a long time, and. Um, I'm not surprised at all. It doesn't surprise me because he is that good, and you know we did it last year in such an average, in such an average team, such, such an average Aston Villa team, and he dragged us through so many games um, single-handedly. And um, you know, if people say that, that the Premier League is the best league in the world, then if he can do it in that stage, then for me, it, it was never going to be a doubt for him to do it on on the international stage. Um, I think if you look at the teams that. England play apart from Belgium being the, the, the best ranked team in the world. They, you know they haven't played that many top top teams, and um, for him to do what he did against uh, against Belgium, he, he looked like he was having so much fun out there, and it was um, it was so easy for him. He's just a gifted. He's just such a gifted footballer, and, and like I say, there's no, there's nothing more I can say about Jack Rillis that 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 you know that hasn't been said because he is just he's that good. And and I called it a few weeks ago. I said I wouldn't swap him for anybody in world football, and I stick by that now. And it's funny now, you know. Southgate's post-match interview, he did look a little bit like, you know, humble pie. He, he was sort of, you know, he was, he, he said he was outstanding. And, and as Tommy said, like Jack's forced his hand now and there's no way that you can, you can leave him out of, of, of the first 11. And, and there's no way that he won't go to the Euros and, and be a starter. What do you think, Tommy, is that when I think about the Jack Grealish that was at Villa when you, when you arrived at Villa those years ago, what's the difference between Jack Grealish now and Jack Grealish then? I think one of the turn, not that there was a turning point because he was always so bloody good. Um, I think a lot of why he wasn't probably hitting the heights and, and maybe the numbers that he, he should have been. This is going back. He was a very young man at the time. Yeah. Um, but probably was down to frustration, felt the burden of a relegation, felt it was almost his responsibility and he was almost trying to do too, too much. Um, but I think the real, as I say, there wasn't a turning point, but the, the point where I think things really clicked in to gear for Jack was he had a bit of an injury um, under, uh, I think Steve Bruce was the manager then. And, yeah. and uh, he had a bit of a period out and he just went to work and, and he'd come back. Like he always, you could just tell like, I'm not being obviously together every day and you see each other stripped off on that. And you could just see the frame he had and he was just waiting to sort of explode into it. And when he had the injury, he come back and he, like, he's some athlete. He, he, he's really the key to him, but he's a lot quicker as well than than, than what people think. Um, oh, yeah. And when you put all them ingredients on top of the skill and the natural ability he has, and I think he'll quote it himself, a, a big a big person who, who's, who's played a part in, in his development was Ollie Stevens, the, the yeah. Um, yeah. strength and conditioning, and they're, they're good friends and and. I even think at one stage he moved Dolly into the house and they was living together, taking things that little bit more serious. Um, and as Chris said, it, it's no surprise knowing the talent that he had and then applying himself the way he did over that injury to, to see the rewards that he's getting now. In some ways, are you surprised it took him so long to get an England call-up? Were you surprised he didn't pick one up last season or even towards the back end of the Championship season because he was unplayable in the Championship? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... The thing that I think uh, gets a lot, the, the thing I have to respect Gareth Southgate on is he clearly has a system and a way of playing and, and personnel that he tries to get into the system. And I think he saw Jack as that sort of inside left forward. And when you look at the players that he was competing with, like it's Raheem Sterling, it's Jaden Sancho, it's Marcus Rashford, they're not run of the mill players. They're extremely, no. extremely good top, top players. Um, and he wasn't just going to bring Jack along for the ride, you know. So I think now he's changed it a little bit. He's had a few injuries. He's seen how good Jack is. He's seen that Jack is probably on a par with these people now. Um, and as you say, he, he's forced a hand. And there's absolutely no way you can't take a player like that to a tournament when it's knockout football. 
yeah. um, because he yeah. can turn a game on its head, can't he? So there's no way he can miss out for me for the Euros. Um, and it's just about getting him into the starting eleven with all that other talent. Yeah, Dolan, I mean, you said after the Arsenal game in our post-match point show, you, you labelled him world-class. And at first, actually, I think I kind of belittled you a little bit because I, I look at world-class as being a big statement. But then I guess you're feeling quite vindicated when he's running the show against Belgium. Yeah, I mean, I don't watch world football. So when I say world-class, I'm basing it on, on kind of the top, you know, the top teams in Europe. Um, and would he get into the, most of the top teams in Europe? I think he would get into pretty much any team now um, in, in European football, Barcelona, Madrid, Munich, um, City, Liverpool. He would walk into any of those teams. So on that basis, he's, he's world class. Um, you know, and again, you, you talk about pace, as, as Tommy said, that the goal, the, the, the third goal against um, against Arsenal, he just, he just blew better into pieces and, Better and obviously he's, he's getting on a little bit, but he's still he's still quick. He's quick. Bellerin's quick. And you know, Grealish just completely blew him out of the water. And um, and I think you know we've seen it so many times. He, for all of his sort of I thought flaws last season because he came too deep because obviously he didn't have the quality around him to stay higher at the pitch. But when he came deep last season, you know he would literally carry the ball fifty yards up the pitch. Um, by himself, single-handedly, and then draw the foul. And you, you know, it's so it's so priceless to have a player that has all those kind of assets. And um, yeah, I'm a little bit embarrassed. He, he plays for for Aston Villa because he's he's almost too good for us now, you know. But I'll probably get panned for saying that. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, I spoke in the Athletic. I was basically saying last in the summer he was going to be gone. I thought there was no way we we're going to keep him. I think COVID probably helped Villa a little bit, Tommy, in that respect. But were you surprised to see him sign a five-year deal, or did you expect him to move on? Uh, yes and no. I think when um, like I'm not I'm not talking stupid here because when you compare, like, listen, Man United were obviously the club linked with him and. Uh, Man United a, a huge brand and, and a massive football club but where they are at the moment you know what I mean there's more yeah. there's probably, better times to not, go there there's better times to go there you know it's sort of right club wrong time almost mm -hmm. and knowing the impact that the owners have had and, and I was at the club when the owners come in and, and sort of got to hear the visions of what they had for the club did it surprise me that they went above and beyond to keep him and were able to keep him. No, they, it, it didn't really, because I think that's where the owners want to take the football club. Um, and it just shows you with Jack around, you start getting players like Ross Barkley in. And, you know, with, with, with a season that's very, very open, it, it seems like it's going to be a very exciting one. Yeah, how much of Villa have you seen so far this season? Because just when you think Jack hasn't got another level to go, he seems to find it. He's destroyed Liverpool, he's destroyed Arsenal. He's just at another level now. Yeah, I've seen, seen most of the games uh, that have been on telly. Um, I actually, for all my sins, paid 15 quid for the last one on Sky. I can't believe it. Imagine that. <laughs> At least um, you ain't got to do that anymore. Um, but yeah, no, he, he's been brilliant. He's he, he stepped up again. And like I say, probably hindsight's one wonderful thing. But when you take where he is now and then look back to, like you say, the, the early championship days and even at times last year, I think the reason... He wasn't hitting the numbers that people were saying his talent with his talent that he should have been hitting. I think it was due to frustration. Like Chris said there, he would drop deep and he would get frustrated that the players around him probably weren't good enough. Um, and the club was in such a sort of poor situation and, and poor place for where it had had it been with Jack growing up and where it was at the time. Um, I think a lot of the things that were almost not letting him down, but was stopping him to get into where he should have been was probably his frustration and, and he was probably almost trying too hard and searching too hard in games. Whereas now, you know, you've got such good players, he's all of a sudden picking the ball up in the right places and yeah, exactly. he, he, he's running the game. And the thing I don't like, the thing that I think is a little bit lazy at the moment, everyone's comparing him to Gaza. And yeah. I actually think, I actually think, like, I don't think Jack's like Gaza. Don't get me wrong, he dribbles and he gets, he's got so much more of a, uh, a skill set to, than, than I think Gaza had. Like, I, I honestly said to someone about a year ago, I, I can see Jack later on in his career dropping and almost becoming a defensive midfielder because for me, he's the one that... Yeah, he, like runs, he, he, he runs a game. 
Like yeah. he he controls a game on his own, the tempo of a game, he speeds it up, he slows it down, he's intelligent. Um Take yeah, a pass. I, I honestly yeah, I think later on in his career you'll see him dropping deeper and deeper and almost becoming the one that sits in front of a back four and dictating play almost. I might be completely wrong here, but I feel like Perlo probably started out as a number yeah, 10 yeah, and yeah. then he ended up moving back as he got on his career. Because one thing that goes unnoticed with Jack, I always think, is the weight of his pass. Yeah. He never gets it the weight of a pass wrong, does he, Tommy? And it, like you say, his distribution something that I don't think gets picked up on enough. No, I think the ball, he slipped down the side for Ollie Watkins in the last game. He, you see Ollie Watkins, he didn't even have to break stride. Um, yeah. And stuff like that, it's so undervalued. And it won't be until he gets older in his career that people start appreciating that more and more. A bit like Perlo, like you say. Because he's he's also like playing a different position now to to what he was when when you were at Villa. I mean, we'll probably come on to Steve Bruce, and this isn't a dig at Bruce at all, but it's very different playing from the left under Dean Smith than it would be playing under the left under under Steve Bruce, isn't it? So he's kind of got that freedom to play there. But he he always saw himself as a central player when you were at Villa. If you'd have told him he was going to go on to play left wing, I don't think he'd have been happy. No, um, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, he, he was almost playing as an eight, like, and then a ten, and it was almost. It was like he was a luxury to get him. But I think, as well, a big making of him is, is, is Matty Target. Don't get me wrong. Tails yeah. every time Tails plays, the understanding Tails has got because he's used to playing that football with high fullbacks and expansive football, and Tails does it naturally. But Matty Target's got that little bit more pace and a little bit more athletic, where he actually gets beyond Jack and frees Jack up quite. Yeah, because Villa looked like Watkins drifting from the left. Barkley can go over and wander on the left. I mean, that's where the, the first goal came against Arsenal the other day. Target go, gets a lot of stick from Villa fans generally, but he, he's a very good player and he enables Jack to, to play his game. Yeah, I, I, I'm like, I've, I've actually met him as well. And this is, this is the best thing, that the, the thing that I... The, the reason why I paid the money to watch Villa the other day is uh, I, I believe there's a team there now that you can really resonate with. And they was all sort of made in the lower leagues. They've all done their time in, in the championship, if you like. Um, it's a core of British lads. Um, they're within a similar sort of age range. Uh, and it's just a team that you could almost see sticking together for, for the best part of three, four seasons and getting better year on year. Mm, yeah. um, and for me, like we we had it at Bournemouth when I was at Bournemouth, we had that success, and it was very very similar in terms of the things that I've just said before. And fans would love coming to watch Charlie Daniels getting better every week, and Simon Francis getting better every week, and that's what I think Villa fans have have really got to look forward to for the, for the next three or four years. Yeah, and I think my main takeaway from that is that you're definitely an Aston Villa fan for life now, Tommy <laughs> Dolan. We move on to, to Tyro Mings now, someone Tommy knows very well, but two starts for him in the international break as, as well. But he's, he's put himself in a good position for the Euros, and Joe Gomez, his injury's probably done him a favour, hasn't it, Dolan? Yeah, I was sitting watching in, in the game um, the other night, and just thinking about the, the critics that Dean Smith got whenever he, he brought him in on loan, and and um, you know, and then obviously the, the critics that we got when we paid 25 million quid for him, and um, I think he's answered every single, um, you know, every single uh, uh, sort of negative bit of press that he's had about him. I think he's answered it, and uh, he's he's looking more and more of a of a Rolls Royce defender as as the games go on. And um, obviously Tommy will, will know him well. He's he's played alongside him, but um, he seems to this season have cut out the silly errors. I, th- I always felt Mings had a had a had an error in him. I always thought he had a mistake in him last season. Um, but this season he seems to be a lot more solid, um, a lot more assured, and um, you know even even from set pieces he seems to be m- more of a threat. Um, and I think you know even as a team we haven't been this, we haven't had this much of a threat since of, you know at, at set pieces since since we had um, Melberg and Larson in the team. Um, I think now we we look like a, a real big unit, real real sort of strong unit going forward as well from from set pieces. So. No, I think Mings. I I think you'll make the squad. I think you'll get in. He probably won't be a starter. Um, still, still can't believe that Harry Maguire starts for England week in week out. I think he's um he's having a pretty poor season. And uh, um, if you pick Maguire, shouldn't be anywhere near that squad. So I would have Konza in that squad um, alongside Mings without a doubt. I think Konza is looking like a real class act and a real snippet, twelve million quid. 
I'll tell you what, Harry Maguire won't be sending you any Christmas cards, mate. There, I thought he was quite good last night, to, to be fair. But Tommy, Tyro Mings, that again, the elevation, that the levels he's got to when, when he joined Villa, the, the turnaround really to now being an England regular, that, that's massive. Did you ever envisage that? Uh, honestly, no. Um, and obviously, I'll go back with, with Tyrone uh, back to the Bournemouth days. We, yeah. uh, we signed Tyrone the, the year we got uh, promoted to the Premier League. We paid £8 million for him. And even when we paid that money for him, uh, like, listen, he, he won't mind me saying, but we was all a bit like, well, that, that, it's enough money. You know, somebody just come out of non league and um, only sort of really done a year, 18 months, if that. Uh, in the championship, um, and we paid eight million for him, which was was a was a big fee for us. Um, yeah. And I spent the year with him there. Um, very mature lad. He was about, about very very intelligent lad. Yeah. Um, and he got he got a real serious injury, uh, something similar to what I've got now, within fourteen minutes of his debut. Um, so I had left the season after, obviously, to join Villa, and then two years later sort of teaming up again with him at, at, at Villa he come on loan didn't he so yeah you could you could immediately see the improvement that he had made um, but if you'd asked me the day that we signed him at Bournemouth would a Premier League club like Villa be signing him for the money they did I'd have absolutely said no but again he's just got so many um, attributes uh, I think he's this season, I think the biggest change in him is, that, that is actually how composed he is. I think yeah. he's finding a lot more passes and we all know physically how good he is. Obviously, he looks lovely on the left side and uh, if he can piece all these games together like he has done in the first part of the season, if he can carry that on for the rest of the season, 25 million quid looks cheap again. Am I right in thinking Bournemouth signed him as a left-back? So when he was first primary at Bournemouth, he was seen more as a left-back? Charlie Daniels, who, who, who obviously great servant for Bournemouth and Year on year, they was always trying to challenge Chaz, and they could never quite bring one into Chaz's level. Um, and we signed him as a left back, um, and he couldn't break in past Charlie. Charlie kicked on again, um, and then he had his injury. And then I think during his injury, he obviously managed to to look at the game and learn. Not there's not, not enough left footed centre halves about. No. Uh, um, and obviously with his height and his his, his, his pace and stuff, you know, if if he if he could be made into a centre half, which Bournemouth did really, like you could see, he had it all to become a top centre half like he is now. How important is it as well to have that left footer on the outside of, of the back three? Because Southgate seems set on a back three. We've played it now for the the last few international breaks, and sometimes you see Maguire playing on the left. I think we've had Dyer at left centre back as well. But as a unit, how much easier is it when you've actually got a left footer playing as a left centre back? Oh. It's massive. Like I, I, I see even in a two, I see a left side centre half and the right side of the centre half as, as totally different positions. You have you can switch between the both. Um, and I, I remember going to Newcastle away for Villa. And Steve Bruce played me on the left side of the three. God, um, and during yeah, just I think after twenty minutes, I knew I was in for a, for a, for a tough night. Um, so yeah, that it, it, for me it's massive. As you talk about the balance, like again going back to Villa, like the balance that they've got in their side with Matt Target, Tyrone Mings, Konza, and, and Cash, and then sort of going forward, Jack rolling off the, off the line and, and and Target getting around him. You know, it's, it's all that stuff that is taken for granted sometimes, and that's a massive, massive key. And for me, like Harry Maguire, I think he actually probably prefers playing on the left side when you watch him. He's he always seems to be playing on the left side. Um, I didn't watch the yeah. game last night, but they say he done very well. Um, but personally, I would always opt for a left footer on, on the left side if I could. Yeah, Dolan, I think I remember actually watching a, ga- a game with you, Reading away. I think Tommy and, and Tyrone played together in a, in a, a nil-nil draw, really, really exciting game. Wasn't if well. I recall. Say again? Martinez uh, was in goal as well that day. Nah, for- you mean uh, Kalinic? No, no, Martinez was in goal for Reading. Oh, for Reading, yeah, 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 yeah. He was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. That was a, a yeah. weird day. Just what's yeah. what's he like to play next to Tommy Toro? What's he? Uh... Yeah, no. Again, he, he, that side of his games come on massively. He's very dominant. Um, he likes to lead. He's a natural talker. Um, the thing I love about playing with centre half that talk, you know, the thing I hate, should I say, is lads commentating and talking for the sake of talking. 
yeah it becomes annoying and you start hearing the same stuff and but when you're actually getting useful information it's like gold do you know what i mean and and when you've got that trust with someone we picked up a relationship really quickly at villa because of we had been schooled in the same way tyrone obviously me before tyrone but then tyrone after i left at bournemouth we we were on the same page straight away so um i think we had five games together and we click with someone do you know what i mean and i've always felt comfortable playing next to tyrone i remember playing pre-season games with him as well at, when he was at left back and yeah no he, he's he's obviously the dominant one in that back four and, and the leader in that back four and obviously Jack's the captain and, and, and rightly so but I think behind Jack you know you've got some real strong leaders and, and, and Tyrone's one of them. Yeah and, and next to Jack as well you've got John McGinn Tommy who, who's qualified for the Euros with Scotland that day beat Serbia on penalties just how, just how pleased are you for him? Ah uh, delight like he couldn't get enough out of out of the game for me because I just absolutely love him um, he, he's like a rubber ball he's bouncing off the walls every day and, and yeah just works so hard at his game and like you talk about 25 million for Tyrone looking cheap and 12 million for Konza looking cheap you know when you talk about 2 two million quid for John McGinn yeah. like, I know it's ridiculous I said I said it's point for point for the best that's that's true. I think it's point for point the best and then that the club's ever made, really. If, if you look at like profit, um, you know, with him, we, 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 he, he'd go. For, he's fifty. He's fifty million pounds worth a player now. He's. Yeah, it's not just what he does. It's not just what he brings on the pitch. It's around the place as well that you can't put a value on that. And you know, when you're talking about all these players as well, we're obviously talking a lot about the lads that are starting. But behind that eleven, you know, you need an underbelly and you need strength in depth and. You need good proper men around as well. And when you talk about like people like Tom Heaton and, and Neil Taylor and, and Connor Hurahan and, mm. and 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 the rest, you know, they're they're the ones that are propping the eleven up and bringing the best out of them. Yeah, just wanted to ask you a bit about Connor because he, he's he's been away with Ireland and Ireland are not in the best of states at the moment at all. I'm sure he'd probably tell you that himself, but. He got dropped from Villa. Obviously, Ross Barkley came and he got dropped off the back of a goal and an assist. And we, we've not seen him again on the pitch. And he seems to be someone who, who's always a full guy for Villa. He always seems, seems to miss out and find himself out of the team and then work himself back in. Just what, what's he like around the place when he's out of the team? Yeah, no, he, like obviously, I didn't spend too much time there when he was out of the team. He was always playing. He was one of the first names on the team sheet. And uh, again, probably, I'm not sure actually how much they paid for Connor, but when you talk about so, value and do you know what I mean two, two million it's it's yeah. it's nothing really when you look what he's done for the club and it, you'd always have Connor around just just for the laddie is the professionalism the training and and this will kill him like if you said this to him because I know how hungry he would be to be playing and he'd say yeah but Con look where you were three or four years ago and look you're getting dropped for Ross Barkley in a top six Premier League side like is it really that bad and he would he would be devastated that you're saying that and he, he's good enough to be in that team as well. Do you know what I mean? And he, he's a top, top player. Um, and, and this is, when you're talking about success, it's never the 11. It's always the, the, the 25 and then the lads underneath it, keeping the ones on their toes in front, you know, playing probably as much at the moment. But he's only one sub-appearance away from getting on Wooten in a corner and it's another assist or getting on, getting a free kick and whipping one in the top fins and then he's playing again. So... He'll get his game time this year, but unfortunately, when you're you just have to be the one that's not in in the lights every week and and is the one propping the rest up. But is it is it really such a bad thing? I'm not sure. Yeah, because Villa are going to have to rotate a little bit international games as there has been club football games so far. So people like Jack and McGinn who've been involved in in every international game uh, be back at training tomorrow they'll be they'll be back there with the lads but what's it like when you when players are on international duty and, you, and you've got to train what what's training like there and then having to go into a game situation with when players have been away yeah it just depends like obviously villa have probably got so many internationals now um that they'd that, that have that have worked hard um They've had a few days off, rightly so, too, because of the amount of fixtures that we are cramming in at the moment. But the, the, the big thing with this, I, I don't know where it's come from all of a sudden. Like England have played three games this week. Like, I don't know, yeah. where, when did you start playing three games on an international duty? And that's going to be the tough thing for, for every club now is managing players and 
the managers will be frustrated that they haven't got the players at their training ground, but hopefully they've all come back fit and, and sound and quick turnaround now to try and get some detail in before a tough game on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, Dolan, it is the Tommy Elphick derby on Saturday, Villa against Brighton. What are you expecting from it? Because we actually called it before the Arsenal game. We thought being away, playing against one of the, the big six, well, stereotypical big six sides, we thought, thought it would suit Villa after a couple of defeats. But it's now a different kind of test being back at home against, no disrespect, a team that you're expected to beat. Yeah, I mean, we were at the game last year when we won 2-1 in the last minute and I thought Brighton played us off the pitch, even with mm-hmm. 10 men. They were very, very good. And um, I think even this season, uh, their stats have been have been up there, you know, like the possession of football passes, chances created, but they just can't seem to to to, to, to score and, and get results. Um, listen, I fancy us to win. We should be winning in uh, this kind of game. If we, if, if we want to have aspirations of top seven, top eight, these are the kind of games that we should be winning. Our next three games, in fact, I think we should be getting maximum points. But with, with the way it's gone this season and the... Uh, the leagues and, and 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 results, you know, we've come off the back of of, of two tough Arsenal, three 0 when Arsenal would really be thinking that they would be able to turn us over quite quite comfortably, and it's not the way it goes. So um, it'll be tough. It'll be tough. They they play good football, but I just hope I just hope we've got we've got more about us this season, and um, and we've got enough quality, I think, to to get three points. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much you've seen of Brighton so far, Tommy, but actually a team I, I quite enjoy watching because they are quite pleasing on the eye, but you do always feel like that. They're not, I don't want to say plan B because it's too obvious, but they, they play this brand of football, but they actually get beat quite a lot as well, and they're, they're down at the bottom at the moment with six points. I mean, I don't know if you saw the Man U game. They absolutely battered them, hit the yeah. woodwork five times, but they still end up losing. Yeah, I've seen quite a bit of them, actually. Just I don't know. If, if I was a Brighton fan, I'd be almost a little bit frustrated at the moment because... They are, as you say, playing so well and, and everyone's talking about the, the, the change that Graham Potter's made from last year and, and from obviously when Chris Hewton left the year before last, sorry, and, and how good it is. But at the end of the day, like it needs to be productive as well. And, and I don't know, it's a little, little bit frustrating. They, they play like a top six side. So when you're talking about Villa playing against, doing well against the top six side and almost suiting them, like this, this, this for me will suit them and, and Brighton will be right for him. Um, I just, I just certain things just just don't seem as rosy as, as they should be down at Brighton. There's, there's been a few issues with um, the striker Mol- Molpe. Uh, the manager left him out apparently due to his ego. wanted wanted to give clip his wings a little bit. Um, he left mm-hmm. Matty Ryan out the last game, I think. Played a young goalkeeper, so things don't quite seem settled down there. Yeah, Molpe is someone who like Villa have been linked with a couple of times. Have you have you ever played against him? Yeah, played against him uh, quite a bit actually when when he was at Brentford uh, for Villa. Um, fiery character. Um, he, he he was obviously too good for the championship. He was he was very sharp, um, and you can see when he plays, he plays on the metal. You know, he's he's always on the edge. And um, but when you look at his return this season for for how well Brighton have been playing, probably isn't enough yet. No, and Dolan, I don't know how much, again, you've seen of him, but Tyree Lamptey at right wing back, he's had a good start to the season. He really looks a player, but unfortunately for him, England have got about 75 right backs at the moment, so it's going to be difficult to break him. But what have you made of him from what yeah, you've seen of him? Well, I think it'll be difficult for, for Brighton to keep him um, with the way he's playing. I think he looks an absolutely incredible talent. Is He He, he didn't come through the ranks, did he? Or no, did Chelsea. He come from Chelsea. Chelsea, yeah. yeah. Oh, he, looks, he looks incredible. Um, plays with absolutely no fear. I saw their game against Palace. I always keep a, a, a little eye on Palace, and uh, I watched the Brighton Palace game, and he was again, he was he was fantastic um, in that game. But um, yeah, a, a real talent. But I think um, Brighton will be it'll be tricky for them to keep him. I think there'll be a lot of big clubs, um, top top four clubs, um, looking at him next season for sure. Yeah, and as an avid Aston Villa fan now, Tommy, are you going to be able to watch the game on Saturday? Uh, what is it? Three o'clock now. I'll probably oh, yeah. be watching Huddersfield, to be honest. Uh, that's that's yeah. fair enough. I can't so, can't really argue with that. Yeah, Stoke away. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's rare for Villa. Yeah, it's rare for Villa to have a Saturday three o'clock kickoff. To be fair, I, I cannot remember yeah. the last time Villa played on, on Saturday at three, at three p.m. Does stuff like that make a difference? You know, with meals and stuff before games, does stuff like that help, like help or hinder playing at certain times? Um, not when not when the crunch, not when the whistle goes. You know, certain players are preferred to do certain things, and I was always one that I, I quite like to go away and stay in hotels and. Uh, have my food cooked for me or do you know what I mean I, I just prefer okay. doing it that tra- travelling that way on a coach and yeah no, not really no okay. 
just something that popped in my head there as we were talking. We're going to going to move on now to your time at Villa, Tommy. Th- three years at, at the club. Overall, how, how do you look back at it? Um, oh, listen, to say uh, I look back with ultimate happiness would, would be a lie. Like, it was very frustrating. Um, yeah, listen, I wouldn't change it for the world. I've, I've said that plenty. Uh, learned some unbelievable lessons about myself, about football um, that, that I think will stand me in, in good stead for, for beyond my playing days. Um, but ultimately, I was happy to come back and, and see the club get promoted. That was always the aim from day one. Um, it's something I'm proud to, to say that I've done is is, is, is sign for, for Aston Villa um, and, and captain one of what I see as one of the biggest clubs in, in, in the country. So, uh, as I say, wouldn't change it for the world. Would I go back and change certain things? Yes, I would. Um I'd probably wait a little bit longer to, to assign for the club. I think when you're always the first one in and, you know, it took, took a bit of time to get that transfer window going and to get that squad settled and, and sort of I was the one that everyone was looking for to, to whip it all into shape. And I don't know, the club was in a proper, proper mess when mm-hmm. when, when a few of us arrived, you know, and to see where it is now and, and, and to know that like a a few of us played a small part in that, you know, something that you can walk away with with, with a bit of pride. You know, there were some real stand-up characters there when I look back and people that I'm still in touch with, someone like Mila Yedinak, you know, and when yeah. I look back at the likes of Glenn Whelan, James Chester, uh, John Terry when he came in for a bit, Snodgrass, um, Connor Hurahan, you know, when, when you look at them proper characters coming through the door and changing the culture of the club and, you know, it was... It was it was a it was a, si- a, a ship that was was definitely sinking, um, and something that is probably listen. I didn't have the greatest relationship with Steve Bruce in terms of on, on the pitch, but the respect that I have for him as a manager and how he managed to to turn that around was was nothing short of of remarkable, really. Yeah, because Villa obviously got taken over pretty much, pretty much just before you joined. So as fans, we'd just gone through a horrendous season, 17 points. It was it was absolutely horrendous, probably my worst experience of following Villa, being a, being a football fan in general as well. And you kind of think when the takeover happens that, right, everything's sorted there. But that obviously wouldn't be the case at all because you would have just walked into an absolute mess, even though there was new owners. It just takes so long Um like the club the previous summer and, and probably the previous summer on that had decided to go in a, a, a different route and invest in a lot of young foreign lads that now they've left the club have gone to do on do great things. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there's plenty of them that we can sit here and name. But again, like you talk about right club, wrong time or whatever, a lot of them lads were thrust into a situation that they wasn't ready for. And then on top of that, you've got new lads coming in. And like I remember uh, the week before pre-season, we did... 11 v 11 with six floaters like in the middle of the pitch and the floaters are people like Jolien Lescott, uh, Akore, uh, Veritu, um, Amavi, uh, I think Rudy was one of them, Gested, and, and they're all like top established, unbelievable careers, gone on to have unbelievable careers and it was just where nobody knew what was wanted for them or whether they was moving on or whether they was wanted and it just took so long to sort all that out and the one thing that Steve Bruce did the minute he came in who was on board and who wasn't and get rid of the ones who wasn't on board and bring in lads that were going to be on board um, so it was just all them stuff that was going on behind the scenes and I think the things with relegation as well where Villa was such a big club so many people were damaged by it almost and once it's in that psychology losing becomes a habit and it's very very hard to turn that around yeah, I mean, it was it was undoubtedly a difficult time. But I, I remember you coming in and thinking, this guy t- ticks every box. You'd obviously you've got promotion experience. You you captained the team to, to promotion. You were still at a good age at the time. Got the experience as well. But it just never really worked out, did it? And what was it that the change with Steve Bruce coming in? Did that did that change? Because you obviously were playing every week no, under Matteo. Yeah, I was playing the first few games that that the, um. I tried to take on a little bit too much responsibility myself and almost forgot about my own form. Like, I just want to look at it as myself, you know, and I was never, ever, uh, uh, I never hit the ground running, really. Uh, but I remember the first game I played, I, I played pretty well at, at Sheffield Wednesday and then we yeah, went on I and remember. I think we beat Rotherham after that. And we we, just, we weren't actually doing as 
bad as what everyone was thinking. We, we were just drawing. To, um, just to draws. Yeah. I remember Steve Bruce come in. Yeah, Steve Bruce come in. I played his first game. He drew again, 1-1 one, one with Wolves. And I got injured in the last 10 minutes. And then, obviously, Nathan Baker and Chelsea started playing. And like you go back to what we said, the balance and the left foot was in and the right in. Chesley and Bates just seemed to click and, and I was the one who was having to support the two for a little bit and when you're the one that's come in as the captain and the one that was going to save this sinking ship and you were sort of the knight in the shining armour and all of a sudden you're on the back foot and it's not quite working out for you and then the club are winning games and people are looking, well, you're winning games, what's going on there? Mm-hmm. You're getting a little bit of a rut and I was frustrated with, with that situation. Um, Steve Bruce... 100% rightly wanted to keep me around and keep me on board. I remember that January, I mean, I had options to go back to the Premier League. Um, I had options to go on loan to to, um, to to a couple of Premier League clubs. Um, I never really, I never felt at ease with what, what I was being told. Uh, so someone was straight with, with, with me from day one. They'd have got a better response from me. So anyway, you, mm. you stick around the next summer. They bring, obviously, someone in like John Terry. And, you know, he's always going to play. And I, again, I was the one sort of behind it. I got in and over Christmas, um, played a, a couple of games over Christmas, was pulled in from sort of nowhere, really. I remember playing against um, Brentford, uh, done all right. And then he dropped me again and then turned up. to I think we was playing Middlesbrough, we were third at the time. Um, and someone got ill. I ended Ended up playing. We won one nil. Played three days later. We beat Bristol City five nil, I think. Um, and I felt like going, and that's that's yeah. the time to kick on. Like I was halfway through my contract, things were starting to pick up. And uh, unfortunately for me, JT come back, and and I was obviously the full guy. Which which again, it's it's John Terry. Do you know what I mean? Go back to the Conor Hurrahan situation now, and I totally understood that. But again, I just never felt like I was getting straight answers. Um, I was being told one thing that, that I wasn't allowed to leave and and, and 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 the next thing I'm getting phone calls from managers telling me that I'm available for loan and end up going on loan and that I went to Reading um, got injured, that didn't quite work out and then I was back in the same situation the next summer, so it was just one of them things for me, it never really ever got going I never, I'm someone who needs to be playing six, seven, eight games to get into a bit of rhythm and, and, and get into yeah. a bit of stride but when you and you're coming in for a game here and there, and then you're taken out psychologically. That's for someone who's used to playing every week and being the skipper and the one everyone looks up to. That's hard to to deal with. So, as I say, I think my overriding emotion when I look back at my Villa days were frustration. But I look back at it and I learned so much. Different styles. Um, again, in three different managers, I saw Don't a Champions we've League lost. winning. Tommy there, Donald, are you still there? Yeah, still oh, there. Yeah. Still there. Still there. Yeah. Still right. Funny noise. Everyone's still there? Yeah. Don, I was going to say, what, what are your memories of, of Tommy at Villarreal? Uh, the bandage on the first day against Sheffield's yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> that picture uh, when, he's, when he's on the ground um, covering blood. Um, but, uh, yeah, can, can, you, can you hear me, Tommy? Yeah, yeah back, mate, yeah. Nice one, nice. Yeah, yes, sir. But, no, again, I think, I think um, as Tommy... I think he's, he was the right player at the right club at the wrong time, and um, you know we'll never know what what it was like behind the scenes, having to to walk into the to the absolute mess that was left by Lerner, and then the uh, the subsequent mess that carried on under 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 um, Tony Gia. But even you look back when Dean Smith um, was was having a having a run of games, and you know that that game against Derby where we won four 0 and and uh, again you came off injured in that game, and, and we go on a ten game. When in running, it was just so unfortunate um, that, that that happened. But I think it was nice. I think it was meant to be that you were there to lift the trophy and, and, and be there against Derby. And um, like you kind of came around full circle, really, in, in the end, that you were there to see us promoted to the Premier League. And it was essentially, it was job done, you know. So um, I think in the end, like, you'll... You ask any ask any, any Aston Villa fan, uh, I think I think everyone would, would have would have very, very fond, fond words to say about you, man, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely without doubt. Just tell me what all Villa fans talk about it that season. It was it was a hot topic that first half of the season. Just that Villa didn't really have any centre backs. Yeah, yeah, they still let you go out on loan. You'd start the season well. You scored yeah. against Hull, and then you end up playing for Hull a week or so. Like, just 
How weird was that? Because it was a strange, strange situation. Yeah, I mean, listen, that that was the most frustrating part for me. Um, even that whole game, I wasn't actually meant to play in that game. Um, it was going to yeah. be Chesi and Mele, but Mele went downhill the night before and, and you know, you play and you score again. And I think, go on, then we won 3-1 and let's, let's kick on. We could have a good, good year here. And the next day you get someone who sorts all the loans out approaching a country that's not love and even the manager's not even told me this. And you go and see the manager, he says, no, that's absolutely rubbish. We've got no centre arts. Why would I let you out on loan? And then the next week, I'm in a car driving to Hull, available for loan again. So it's just stuff like that that, listen, at the end of the day, whatever, Steve Bruce just wasn't having me. And there's no problem with that. As I say, I've got so much time and respect for him what he, and what he's doing at Newcastle now, now, the promotions he's had. And for me, he was an unbelievably big factor in changing Villa's fortunes and, and steering that ship to safety. Um, so I've got nothing but admiration and respect and I've learned so much of him. But I just wish from day one I was sat down and told, look, you're not for me and, and you can sort of part your ways and that's it. But as Chris said, I went to Hull and one of my big pals is a massive, massive Villa fan and things are happening that season. Axel come back on loan. He got injured. Chesies, you can see he's playing through the pain barriers. There's no centre art. And the closer it was getting to Chris, my pal would ring me up sort of it was getting every day saying do you think you could come back do you think they'll call you back and then Dean Smith gets the job and always remember playing against Dean Smith's teams and just thought that this most unbelievable swagger and, and way of playing football something that excited me and I got the phone call it was all that I was really consumed by and again was just a privilege to come back for the six months and, and to work with him and his staff and, and to see how he does things yeah, because you were actually in the team at the start of that that grind next next to Mings, as we spoke about earlier. Just how good was it to just get to play a part in that that unbeaten run that Villa did? Yeah, like, and, and I look back, and I, I think I played fourteen or fifteen games that season, so I don't really see it as a promotion on my CV, but it's on my CV. Do you know what I mean? I've had four promotions in my career, yeah. two to the Premier League, and Villa's as proud as. The one I'd have had the first one with 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 Brighton back in the day, you know, my hometown club getting promoted. So to have played a small part in that, as I say, is something I look back with with fondness. And when I went back, I could just see the potential that that team had, um, but something wasn't quite clicking. Um, and I think it was a one-one draw away at Stoke, the game yeah. before Derby, where things really started to come together in the second half. And the manager gave us a big dressing down that, that night. And said, like, if we didn't pull our act together, I was like, this, this is only going to go one way and the, the season's going to sort of... 4-0, it coincided with Jack coming back and being handed the armband. And, you know what I mean? That, that's it. We ride off into the sunset. So, as I say, to, to have played a small part, I scored that season as well, which I look back at, scored on the first day. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not something I really look back at that promotion team but I played a small part you know yeah certainly some some vital contributions over over the three years and part of the side that, that got us back on track and ultimately got us promotion Tommy we can't thank you enough for, for joining us tonight it's been an absolute thank pleasure you. to have you on it's always good to talk to you obviously the second time I've, I've spoke to you now but just before you do go can you just tell that Dr Tony story please <laughs> oh, yeah well oh, listen this this some sort of the first six months off at the club and there were so many players that were getting, they just didn't know where they stood do you know what I mean and everyone's heads were being scrambled and some were trying to get out and some were trying to get in and it was just all over the place and we was travelling it was very early in the season Roberto was still in charge and to Ipswich um, for a game and we had trained on the Friday we were due to fly down and I'm up in the canteen and he had a his assistant was called Ho and Ho was quite prominent at the training ground. So you got to know him a little bit. And Roberto used to get us all dining together. We used to eat lunch together after training. And um, so we're all there. And Ho sort of comes up in a mad rush. And uh, he says, oh, Tommy, uh, the owner wants to see you. He's got a present for you downstairs. And I'm like, what the hell? And all the lads are like looking at me like, how tight are you with this guy? Never met him before, bearing in mind. So Ho sort of marches me down the stairs at Bodymore and, and we go along to the boardroom 
and uh, Dr. Tony there, and he's just grilling me on 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 uh, what is Roberto doing, um, what 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 are his training sessions like, what is he compared to Eddie, how what is he saying to you at half time, or what would Eddie say to you, or what would Eddie do, and I was like, oh. it just summed up where we was at a club at the time. But yeah, he made me look a right donut in front of all the lads. <laughs> and I'm presuming there was no present there either. No present, no. No, no, no present. I wouldn't mind. I, yeah, I'll tell you if you give me another three years on top of what I've got. But yeah, nothing, there. <laughs> yeah. nothing worse than being promised a present and getting absolutely nothing. But yeah, Tommy, thanks so much for, for coming on. Great, great to talk to you. And thanks to Luke Roper as ever for, for sponsoring the show. Remember, you can get a discount if you go on their website. If you use the code TVV20, you'll get 20% off your clubber. We'll be back for the post-match point on Saturday at 5.15. Dolan and myself and some of the guests, some of the Villa fans will get on as well. So let's hope Villa get three points against the Seagulls. Thanks to Tommy again. Thanks to Dolan. Up the Villa. Cheers, lads.